Yo, what up everybody? I'm Dave Miranda and this is episode 24 of Just Give Me Five. I hope you guys are doing well, continuing to be great. We've got another amazing show lined up for you today. And we got another sponsor for this episode. Let's check it out. This episode is sponsored by District 48 Coffee. District 48 Coffee is roasted, targeted, and blended right here in Arizona. They have three blends to choose from, and you can pick them up in person inside of Arrowhead Mall in the District 48 clothing store, or you can go online to district48coffee.com. Right now, if you put in promo code GIVEME5, you get $5 off your coffee until June 30th. So what are you waiting for? Hit up District 48 Coffee, where it's coffee with confidence. Shout out to Christina. If you guys caught episode 23 though, we had none other than Arizona radio legend, Melissa the Midnight Mamacita. And let me tell you, that took me down memory lane. Because when I was in eighth grade, I was listening to her show on Lights Out Phoenix. And at the time, I had a little, a little girlfriend, you know, and um, I, was, uh, I, was, you know, I was at my grandmother's house and uh, back then my grandmother had those old house phones, you know, with the long ass cords that could reach from like the hallway to the garage, you know? And, uh, and so I remember I, I called in and I made a dedication to this girl. And I remember the record too, it was Deborah Law's uh, Very Special. And so I'm taking the phone, you know, and I'm, and I'm walking over to the living room because that's where the stereo was. So I wanted to hear myself. So I'm walking, I got this long ass cord just yanking and uh, my grandmother was in the kitchen and she saw me and she's like, what are you doing? And I was like, Nana, nah, nah, I'm going to be on the radio right now. Like, this is serious. You know, it's a big deal, you know? <laughs> and she was like, OK. So she she listened to it with me. And, uh, you know, we hear we hear me on the radio and stuff. And she was like, wow, wow, mijo. She's like, that was that was that was good. You know, you really were on the radio, you know, and she's like, but who's this girl? <laughs> Just good times, man, good times, you know? And so, you know, that just, that just really took me back, you know? And so nothing but love and respect to Melissa, the Midnight Mamacita. Wish you the best and nothing less. Make sure you guys check out episode 23. All right. But today's guest is the mayor of the Arizona hip hop scene. He laid the foundation down many, many years ago. Originally being a member of the hip hop group, No Question, which consists of himself, Mike Wilde, and DJ Daryl D. He then went on and got a deal with Artist Direct Records, and we're gonna talk about that. We're also gonna have him speak on his friendship with Eminem and the late Great Proof and how those came about. Since then, he has transitioned into radio broadcasting, and we're gonna to touch on that as well. This gentleman is that dude, always has been and always will be. So ladies and gentlemen, without further ado, I present to you, Poker Face. I am Poker Face, your baby mama's favorite, the hometown hero, whatever you want to call me. Man. We can talk for days, but all I'm saying man, is just, just give me five. What inspired me to be an MC? I mean, really, you know what? It, it was just coming up as hip hop was coming up, you know? Um, blessed to be part of the golden era of hip hop and, and to live in a time where we got to see hip hop's roots and now all the way through hip hop being the world's biggest cash cow, right? So, um, you know, what originally inspired me? Rakim, uh, Run DMC, you know, Will Smith, D okay. DJ Jazzy Jeff and the yeah. Fresh Prince, you know what I'm saying? You know. Hearing, hearing this stuff, I mean, Grandmaster Flash and Furious Five, right? The message, the message was the coldest record I had ever heard in my life when I first heard the message, you know what I'm saying? Yeah. Uh, Melly Mel, you know, and, and so um, I think just, just how fresh and new hip hop was, you know, growing up in the age of breaking and, and Beach Street, you know what I'm saying? The whole world was starting to figure it out. And, and so, you know, being a young, impressionable youth, I was figuring it out too, you know? And then I think as I, as I got an appreciation for the art form and for, you know, the gladiator sport that, that MCing is, um, I started to really appreciate the intricacies. And, and then as other MCs came along, they kept me inspired. 
You know what I mean? And so, you know, I'll never forget when Nas dropped, Illmatic just shook everything. I was like, hold on, just hang on a minute. I need a second to process this album. You know what I'm saying? When Jay dropped, you know, when Dead Presidents hit for the first time, I was like, well, well turn, turn everything down. What, what, what is this? <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Um, you know, Outkast, Outkast was a big one for me. Um, I had just started making music of my own, you know, actually trying to record some records. And I saw Players Ball, and it was like, again, again, it was like they came in and there was nothing like it in the game. You know what I'm saying? And I think Andre 3000 had a really, really big, um, made a really big impression on me uh, because he was completely different. You know, it wasn't hard like G-Rap, you know what I'm saying? But it wasn't, you know, super artsy. You know, it was it was like that perfect blend. And I, I, I just remember like just being enamored by Outkast, right? Um, so, I mean, those are the early years. But when I talk about like what really inspired me to pick up a microphone, I mean, I got a nod to, I got a nod to Run DMC, LL, Kumo D, that era right there was when I was just like, these are the coolest motherfuckers I've ever seen. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Like, what, right. what is this? You know, before that, it was all Mike and Prince and, you know, it, MTV land, you know what I'm saying? And so you, you got to see urban music, but very little, and it didn't really talk to the street. You know what I'm saying? It was, you know, it was MTV, right? Yeah. So, you know, you appreciated it, but seeing that raw, that raw hip hop for the first time, I was just, I was in love, you know what I'm saying? So. I think that that's kind of where my inspiration came from, that period. So No Question and Artist Direct, man, they're really two, two huge chapters, man. They, they, you know, one kind of bled into the other, but both so significant and so different in their own right. You know, of course, I'm a little bit biased, right? So, yeah. you know. My lens, how I look at things, might be a little bit different than how some other cats remember it. I don't know. I'll tell you this, no question was, in my opinion, right, um, the most important local hip hop group, definitely of its time, and one of the most important all the way through everything, right? And that, that's not just because I'm a part of it, right? right. Um, but we transcended so many different areas like we we blurred so many lines right you know we were real mcs we were true mcs right so the backpackers you couldn't say shit right because i feel like man I, i'll come rap i'll wrap this fucking page around your head you know right. what i'm saying take your backpack and go on back to your cypher right yeah. um but we were street niggas you know what i'm saying so yeah. you know at the same time you know, come, you can come play with us if you want to, but I'm in the cypher with, you know, a 45 in my back, and, and <laughs> you know what I'm saying? Corbin with a nine in his front, and, and you know, we were out there, and we were moving around, you know, over on the northwest side, and, and you know, stepping around in other areas of the city, and, and yeah. just, you know, we were, we, were, we were really out there, and we were sewing together a lot of different pieces, right? Yeah. Um, you know, one of the other important things about No Question is we were one of the groups that showed people it really could be done out here in Arizona, right? Sure. We happened to link with Tyree Michael Carter, TMC Presents, who's a legend in his own right, you know. Um, and Ty was able to pave the way to No Question being seen on a national level, right? Um, because we were opening for some of the, the biggest artists in the world, for all of the biggest artists in the world, really, at the time, um, except for uh, Jay-Z and Tupac. It was the only two that we didn't catch, but I mean, Biggie, Eminem, Outkast, Naughty by Nature, Fuji's, LL, Nas, Wu Tang, uh, Meth and Red, Big Pun, Ludacris. I mean, I, I can just I can go on forever. We open for so many people, right? Yeah. Um, and so you know, I, I believe that hope, right? Hope and fear drive everything. You know what I'm saying? One or the other, right? Love and respect, hope and fear, and no question gave a lot of rappers and a lot of the hip hop scene hope, right? Yeah. Whether you loved us or not, whether you thought we were assholes or not, you know, whether you appreciated our music, the progress that we made, made it look to, to those on the ground like, holy shit, this shit can happen right here in Arizona, right? Yeah. You, you can do it, you can get on the main stage, you can blah, 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 right? You can get the news articles and, right. and that kind of thing, right? And so, you know, by the time No Question was full steam, we rocking Hayden Square, we all over the new times, we voted best group, or uh, excuse me, nominated for best group a million times. 
Um, you know, I'm like the Susan Lucci of the Best of Phoenix Awards. I, I've been nominated myself through about four different groups. I've never, never won. Right? Right. Um, just fun fact. Right? Yeah. <laughs> um, so no question was that, right? You know, we were like, we were like some of the first local superstars. And I say some, because I, I don't want to take credit for the hip hop scene. That's not what I'm here to do, right? You know, you had uh, the weirdos, you had Funky Nuts, you had Dislocated Styles, you had Boys in Black dancing everywhere. You had, uh, 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 I mean, if we go back further, you had Vontel, Overway Pooch, you yes. had, you know, Big Wax and CC. You can't, not, you can't leave them out. Like, by no means did no question create this, but we were that, we were kind of like a transitional group. You know, that made it made it OK to like local hip hop because we wasn't on, you know, the the hip hop purist movement. Right. We were just the right blend to bring a lot of people in. Um, we also started performing. You know, we kind of brought the hood to Tempe and Scottsdale and a lot of these areas where they wouldn't let you. You could we couldn't get in like yeah. a lot of the clubs. You couldn't get in because of what you were wearing right. and not that what you were wearing was off, but that it was black or it was urban. And I mean, let's face it, Scottsdale in, in the early 90s was about as racist as it gets, covert. Yeah, Tempe too, shit. The, yeah. the police, you know, they, they would literally walk the horses through our ciphers and let them shit in the middle. And then if we still kept rapping, they'd come back and pepper spray us, <laughs> yeah, right? right? Yeah. I mean, like, this is just, this is the truth we lived in in the early 90s, you know? But we were resilient through all that, us and, and, a, and a number of others, man, that, that continued to help build the scene, right? So when I talk about No Question's importance, it's, it's from that aspect, right? It's not that we were the greatest rappers in the world, although you could probably tell me any different. Um, but, you know, it, it was what we meant to the people we meant it to, right? And, and kind of the perseverance that we had. You know, you couldn't really do anything to stop us. We got shot at, we got jumped on stage. Um, <laughs> You know, we tore up parking lots after clubs, you know, we dealt with threats. I mean, all kind of shit, right? And it's funny because hip hop back then was like a microchasm of the national hip hop scene. So you had these two big war factions at the time and we fighting each other. And, and at the same time, Bad Boy and Death Row are fighting each other. And, you know, you could draw your crazy comparisons to everything going in this, on in the city at the time. But it was, a, it was a, a remarkable time to be part of Arizona hip hop, you know? Because uh, we were still all trying to find ourselves, right? Nobody, nobody knew what this shit was going to look like. We didn't even know that there really could be a scene. We just all love hip-hop. We kept yeah. doing it, you know? Um, but sadly, you know, no question came to an end. We, um, me and my partner, man, we went hard, man. You know, and, and God bless Mike Wild. He is still, to this day, my best friend in the whole world, you know? Um, but, man, the lifestyle is crazy, and it took a toll on both of us. Um, I don't have a very addictive personality at all. My partner does. And it just, uh, it made for some interesting times, especially as we started to get more and more serious about the music. You know, I, I kind of understood the importance of us being able to work without some of the distractions and it just didn't quite work out the same, right, for the group. So uh, I went solo in 90, 99, uh, the year after we dropped Eclipse. And that kind of led to the artist direct era. Artist Direct was interesting. Um, it was a bit, it was like school, man. Yeah. Like Artist Direct and, and really, really my music industry experience kind of took the place of college uh, for me. So I learned a lot through all of that, you know. Uh, I was working at Hip Hop Trends in Arizona Mills, trying to figure it out, trying to figure out what I was doing with this rap stuff. I had made uh, a couple of demos um, we had put together a group demo, right? So no question was part of a group called the Ten Commandments that was a, a collective of 10 rappers out here. And then Ten Commandments was loosely thrown together. Uh, it turned into the Associates, which was us and our crew. You know, at the time you had Flip Mode, you had Def Squad, right? You know, those kind of things working. Uh, we were the Associates, right? And that was kind of as D12 was emerging on the scene. and. You know, M was starting to get, get his legs under him. And um, the associates was uh, Adam Bomb, Ilshan, uh, Vina Kava, Mega Man Andretti, myself, and Mike Wild. And we, uh, you know, we did some amazing things. And then along came Proof uh, with D12. And then Proof joined the associates. And then it just went through the roof. But to bring all of that back, you know, I'm working in a, the clothing store. And we get a call 
that one of the demos we sent that had all the associates records on there I put a song called You're Not a Rapper at the very end of it and it landed in the right hands Lil Sean of Phoenix radio fame uh, then on the Shade 4 or 5 right uh, Lil Sean had passed the demo uh, to a friend of ours Jesse Beer whose father Lenny Beer owned Hits Magazine which is a trade mag yep. um, Lenny was like yo these kids are, are dope but this kid at, at the end of this tape man you know you got to hear this and he gave it to Ted Field right T Ted and Lenny are close uh, history lesson Ted Field is uh, one half of the duo that started Interscope Records he was the money man Jimmy Iovine's more the music man and I'm, I'm really condensing it right um, but so Ted Ted heard it and, and uh, you know he later told me he just flipped it to his daughter like I don't know listen through this and I think his daughter was like 13 at the time or something like that right 14 um, you yeah, know if you like it let me know and she listened and she loved my record and she went back and told her dad you got to sign this kid right here you, we need him right here you need him um, and so I get a call while I'm working in the mall Ted Phil wants to fly you out to, to Los Angeles they want to talk to you about your music I didn't even know who Ted Phil was so I'm like eh, you know I got shit to do <laughs> yeah. is it serious right um, needless to say we took the meeting uh, they flew us out Friday July 13th Friday the 13th uh, at 11 a.m. we showed up to artist direct offices and by about 11:15, Ted had told me he was going to sign me to a major record contract um, I could try try as I may I won't be able to beat his deal and we tried uh, we talked with black ground uh, we talked with loud some talks that stalled with Def Jam and there wasn't a better deal than what artist direct was offering uh, we took the deal and it was you know obviously one of the best things that ever happened to me um, but it was with a startup even though artist direct was big money and Ted was half of Interscope it was still a startup and Artist Direct was the first company to really embrace streaming. And so the world was kind of trying to figure out what they were doing, right? Because it was all about downloads and CDs and mechanical royalties and that kind of thing. You know, what is streaming, right? So um, landed on Artist Direct and, and from there it was a dream. I signed like one of the, the last uh, fairy tale record deals, right? Huge signing bonus, huge budget, studio fund. All kind of marketing and promotion and touring commitments and everything I mean it was it was as big as it gets uh, seven figure deal um, and then artist direct ran into to their own trouble uh, you know in my opinion they backed the wrong artists uh, smiles and South Star poverty yep. um, you know I think they were working with a Marie at one point and you know not that those weren't great artists but they obviously didn't recoup right or not enough and so Artist Direct had its troubles. I had however many thousands of CDs already in packaging, ready to ship, and Artist Direct went belly up. A lot of learning in there for me, right? Uh, sitting in on all the negotiation of my own deals and, you know, the whole studio process. I mean, you know, I've worked with some of the biggest producers in the game. Uh, Warren G's done records for me, Scott Storch, uh, Bink. Um, we had a session lined up with Kanye, but God bless him, he got hurt in a car accident back then. Um, I mean, Hot Runner, I, I can, really the list goes on, there's a, a gang of folks I've been blessed to, to be in, in their presence. Um, yeah, man, so, you know, I know that's the long answer to question number two, <laughs> but, uh, you know, Artist Direct, it taught me a lot. It was my, my first real foray into the industry, knee deep, and I soaked all the game up. You know, it was all about uh, learning the business and learning as much as I can uh, to make sure I had the right springboard forward, you know. I guess, let me, let me, let me set everything straight, right, on, on the, whole, the whole Eminem, Shady Records proof and how we all kind of got interwoven, right, through, through really, like, I mean, just some of the best times ever. Um, so M and I... M and I were cool, right? Um, real cool. I don't want to insult either one of us or what he and Proof had to say we were close friends like that, right? Um, you know, M was always, I mean, just, you know, more than cordial, amazing to us. You know, had us out of his home. They always rolled out the red carpet for us whenever we were in Detroit. 
Uh, whenever we would meet the team, you know, we, we would meet the Goliath artist and, and Shady Records team out in Vegas or out here on the West Coast quite a bit in L.A. Uh, you know, and they were just always real accommodating, you know, and it was real. Like, it was always real, right? It wasn't, it wasn't everybody fanning out, right? We, shit, we got together and, you know, unwind, right? Let, blow out some steam from all the shit we were going through in our respective areas. Um, I met Em and Proof when they were out here for the Warp Tour in 99. And I, I'd actually opened for him at Club Rio. Um, but then he was back out here for the Warp Tour. And I got a call from Fade, who, who is my lead producer. And really, really, you know, Fade is, is a huge piece of my story, right? You know, benefactor slash lead producer slash, you know, kind of the, the, the mastermind behind uh, what to do with Poker Face post no question, right? And so he, he was really instrumental uh, just in, in the early part of my career. Him and Ty Carter, I mean, you know, I credit, I credit uh, most to the, to the team I had back then. Um, so we, we run into M and Proof. Fade calls me and says, hey, you need to get over here to the, it's like the Double Tree on like 44th and Van Buren or something. He's like, I'm up here with Eminem and, and Proof. And these dudes are freestyle. You got to come up here and rap. You know what I'm saying? And I'm like, how the fuck are you over there with Eminem and Proof, right? And so we had heard about Eminem from G-Rap. We were working on G-Rap's yeah. album. And, um, you know, I, I remember being in the studio. And, and after we were done, he was like, there, yo, there's this kid. You know, G-Rap be like, son, yo, son. Yeah. You know, there's this kid, son, right? right. You know. Fucking, his name, his name is like fucking Eminem or something, you know? And I'm like, <laughs> yeah. you know, we laughing and shit. And he's like, uh, he's like, let me, the, the kid is crazy. He's the truth, right? And he was talking about, you know, M battling. And this is like, I think when M was like beefing with Graf. Um, or was it Graf? I forget the kid's name. Not Graf. Uh, the scam, scam? Is it Scam? I don't know. Okay. Uh, but, they, but this is like some, some Detroit shit, right? They were, they were on some battle shit. And, mm -hmm. I think Emmett had recently blazed the, the Rap Olympics. You know, this was kind of during that era, right? And he yeah. was still coming up. At any rate, um, I went over to the hotel and they spitting and I mean, they spitting, they freestyling, it sounds like it's written. I'm just amazed. I'm like, these, these motherfuckers are crazy. Um, M had to dip, Proof wound up staying and we just sat and built with Proof, to be honest. It was just kind of a, a weird happenstance. He was sitting around before the show had errands to run, ran a couple of errands with him, you know, and um, he was just a real dude, you know. Um, we hung out, hung out after the Warp Tour, and, you know, the, the sentiment was like, hey, you motherfuckers are cool, you know? And it, it wasn't really on no, um, you know, you're M, you're proof, what can y'all do for us? Oh, you know, you guys are some up-and-coming rappers. It was more like, damn, you know, out of all the people I'd have ran into, you motherfuckers seem like you're the realest, you know right, what I'm saying? Right, so. Yeah. You know, that's kind of what it was built on. The whole thing was predicated on. Uh, and then from there, man, it was just friendship, right? So, you know, Fade and Proof were really close. Um, Proof and I became really close. After all was said and done, you know, I, I consider Proof a, a, a mentor and, um, you know, somebody that really helped shape my career and my thinking about the industry, um, how I approach things. Um, you know, M, to be quite honest, was more in the background. Uh, it was more about proof, um, you know, P, I don't really talk a lot about proof, so it's a little weird, right? Um, but P, you know, he was the kind of person that no matter who you were, right, if you were, if you were on his team, you were on his team, right? You were as important, the, the, male, the male clerk is as important as the A&R is as important as the CEO in proof's eyes. There was, there was nothing, right? So, you know, if we out and we had a party and we were out, we were out. You know, but Proof would walk up, he grabbed my arm and run me over to Lior Cohen and be like, Lior, this is Poker Face. Poke, this is Lior, y'all need to know each other. Right? <laughs> and I'm like, uh, wow. you know, hey, I ain't knowing, you know what I'm <laughs> yeah. saying? You know, and, and, but people do that everywhere. Poke, Jimmy, Jimmy, this Poke. He knows Ted, you know Ted, you guys talk. Right? Right. <laughs> Wait, hey, how you doing, Mr. Ivy? <laughs> yeah, you know what I'm saying, right? Um, but you know, that was just the dude Proof was, and he yeah. wasn't tripping, you know what I'm saying? And so, you know, if he loved you, he loved you like that, you know what I mean? Um, and so, you know, it was really, that whole time period, I was trying to figure it out. You know, I didn't know shit. I'm a kid from Arizona that suddenly 
was given way too much money and thrusted into the, the middle of the music industry. You know, Shady Records, Eminem, 50 Cent, Dr. Dre, Aftermath was the biggest shit in the world at the time. And we are literally behind the scenes through all of it. So from 99 to 06, you know, when, when Proof was murdered, um, you know, we are, we're running the Up and Smoke tour. So we are backstage, behind the scenes, at the hotels, on the buses, uh, here, Anaheim, Vegas, LA. Um, you know, we, I was in Chungking. I'm out in the studio when D12 was recording Devil's Night. Wow. And, you know, got a chance. They were actually recording fight music, you know. Um, yeah. You know, got to be there as M is writing the Marshall Mathers LP. You know, we come in off of, of the um, uh, Slim Shady EP and, and just getting, being there to hear M talk about how he fucking hates performing How My Name Is. He's over it. You know what I'm saying? Right. But it's still one of the biggest records in the world at the time. You know, exactly. um, I remember when I was really two feet in my, my deal, you know, the Eminem show, <clears throat> just being one of the biggest records in the world. And I remember riding back and forth to the studio, listening to the Eminem show, tripping that we were getting ready to go meet Eminem out in Vegas. Like, you know what I'm saying? It was like yeah. just that kind of thing, you know? And so they, um, they had a huge influence. You know, uh, I ran 50's first tour with him, with uh, Miko, God bless him. Miko is, as important as TMC and, and uh, Fade were to the beginning of my career, um, Miko kind of picked up midway and he was equally as important to the later parts of my music career. You know, Proof was the person I would call when I was down on myself or the industry or, you know, just this rap shit. You know, I call it, man, man fuck yeah. this shit. You know what I'm saying? Right. Excuse my French, right? You know, right. but, you know, this happened and I'm over this and I'm ready to kill this person. And, you know, people would just be like, Check this out, man. You know, remember who you are. Remember what you can do. Know your worth. Know your value. You know what I'm saying? And, and he got me through some, some dark times, you know? You know, P had moved, was moving to Arizona, and he had spent a lot of time out here with us. And I ran the last five shows with Proof that Proof did before he passed. We did Vegas, and we did uh, Tucson. We did... Phoenix, we did a couple in Cali, we did um, some shit in Albuquerque. And, you know, he, he was in a real good spot. Things were really good with him and M. He had, you know, M and Royce were, were trying to work some things out. And Proof was kind of in the middle of, of trying to broker that a little bit. And, you know, it was just a lot of, a lot of things kind of swirling in. And, um, you know, we had been telling P, hey, come on out here, get, get the fuck out of Detroit, man. It's crazy out there, you know. And, he was gonna close on a house out here. And I remember P decided he wanted to run back to Detroit to, to you know, tie up some loose ends, something they needed to do, I don't know. And so we were all telling P, you know, why? Right, like, right, like don't go. Yeah, you got, you got people there, man. Yeah. How them handle that shit, you know what I'm saying? Keep your ass here, right? And uh, he decided to go anyway, you know? And the rest is history, right? I remember I was on the air I was, I was on at uh, Power 98.3. I think it was Power 98 then. Might have still been Power 92 then. Uh, matter of fact, it was still Power 92.3. Yeah. Um, and I was, uh, I was on right before the nuts came on. I was on overnights, still trying to earn my keep in radio. Um, and I, I got the call at like 5.40 in the morning. Uh, and I know, because I still had about 20 minutes of my shift left. And I just left the station. He told me he had got murdered. He was shot, shot in the head. And that's pretty much it, man. It was a rough time, you know? Because it was like a lot of my hope at that point. Right. Um, it died with proof. Yeah, there was some diminishing. You know? Um, but, you know, while he was here, man, I really got to, uh, to witness some amazing things with proof. The respect that proof got everywhere, everywhere, man. It didn't matter where we went, didn't matter what city, what crew, didn't matter if it was execs or if it was hood niggas. Everybody loved and respected Proof. I mean, you know, obviously, except Mario Etheridge, who, you know, I hope he dies slow and painfully. Um, but, you know, I learned a lot from that, you know, in addition to just being an amazing MC and, and what I learned from Proof on the, just the, the phonetics and the syllables and how he put shit together and, and 
his process for freestyling, how he laid his shows out. He taught me about, you know, building show sets. He did a lot of that for him. People don't know that. Um, but, you know, getting to see how he was the mayor of Detroit. And when I say the mayor, you know, it didn't matter where he went. They rolled out the red carpet for proof. Um, you know, it kind of, uh, it, it helped me understand how I need to relate to people and how I should treat people and how I should bring people along with me and, you know, how when there's an opportunity, go ahead and put somebody in play, right? Make that introduction, why not, right? If you're secure in what you do and who you are and you're doing it right, uh, then you look for those opportunities, right? Nothing, nothing says more about a boss than who you promote, right? And a lot of people don't realize that. Um, and proof did, you know, so, you know, it was a blessing. And then, you know, the dude was a gladiator, man. So, you know, I watched Proof smash Supernatural in, in the middle of the, the, the magic, you know, fashion conference in the Vegas Convention Center at the Def Jam booth or the Fat Farm booth, excuse me. And, you know, the whole conference stopped and the crowds walk up and Proof of Supernatural going at it. And, you know, he killed dude. Dude didn't even want a third round. They unplugged the microphone. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. Supernat will probably be mad if he ever sees this. But I mean, that's, that's, <laughs> yeah, yeah. that's what happened. And don't get me wrong. Supernat's a ninja on Absolutely. his own. He's a shogun. You know what I'm saying? But, you know, just moments like that, you know, rocking with Proof and OB and M at, at Club Blue in Detroit, you know, after hours, you know, we just getting on the mics and, and, and 50 is there and all the G unit and we all just clowning. And I mean, just those kind of times where, of course, I miss them. You know what I'm saying? Um, but, you know, all I can say are great things about uh, Proof and Eminem. You know, M was, um, again, he was not the person you would probably expect the biggest artist in the world to be, right? You know, M's the kind of guy that we sitting in the limousine and, you know, he's, he's going to offer you some game for free, right? Shoot you some advice. Um, just, on, just on the cool, right? He's he the biggest artist in the world. He don't even have to talk to me, right? right? But he let me sit and pick his brain and and had get my questions off and gave me some real life game back, you know, so. Um, I have nothing but great things to say about Shady Records, Paul Rosenberg, Theo Settlemeyer, uh, you know, everybody behind the scenes over there. Uh, Tracy, I love you, Tracy, if you ever see this, you know. Uh, good, good folks and definitely uh, one of the best chapters in my, my book for sure. So radio. Radio is, is a crazy thing, right? Because I fucking hated radio <laughs> as an artist, right? Right. But I hated radio because radio wouldn't give us the opportunities in Arizona. You know what I'm saying? So it wasn't that I hated radio. I hated Arizona radio. And, and more importantly, I hated Phoenix radio. Yep. Um, because I, I always have, and, and to, this, to this day, I still do believe that, you know, Phoenix is very much a follow suit market, right? Um, we ha had been, I don't want to say have, had been afraid to set trends and afraid to set the bar, you know what I'm saying? And, and, and really, really step out there, right? Yeah. Instead, you know, we look to what is LA doing? What's New York doing? You know, what, oh, the Midwest is popping. What's going on in the Midwest? Oh, this is the South? All right, let's bring the South. But, but never, hey, what's going on on the South side, right? You know, right. what's going on in Tempe? Man, these artists are making noise on the West side. Ain't nothing on the West side. How are they doing this, right? So, you know, there was that disconnect for me with radio. As an artist, I always said, whenever I have the chance, because I, I was blessed to have some radio airplay, right? Um, Power 92 embraced uh, a, a few of my records, as a matter of fact, and, and I was able to get some on 101.1, embrace some records. Um, but there's only a handful of us, you know, myself, uh, and I'm talking pre beat locker, you know, right. Willie North Pole, um, Rockadala, uh, Hot Rod, you know, Richie Evans, right? There's only been a yeah. few of us, you know, later on down, uh, you know, Sincerely Collins, right? Futuristic got some airplay. Uh, but I shouldn't be able to count them on two hands, right? Ari yeah. Hip hop's been in Arizona since easily the, the late 80s, early 90s, right? So I always said if I ever get the chance, I was going to get artists on the radio, right? Um, you know, and, and you sit around and you say, man, fuck that. You know, if I ever get in radio, I'm putting everybody on, right? <laughs> right? And it sounds like, we, it's bull, you know, it's bullshit when you say it, right? Yeah. I mean, you mean it, but... It's easier said than done. Yeah, right? How often do you ever think you'll actually get in radio and put everybody on, right? So, you know, fast forward, I was sitting around mad because I felt like I had a couple of other radio records that Power would not embrace. 
and one of my my really close friends and another person I consider my mentor, although he'll probably tell you what folks crazy, right? Uh, but Jay Times Three worked for Power 92 when I was there, and Jay is one of the best radio personalities I've ever seen in my life. He is effortless. You know, the way I would like to think I am on a microphone rapping is how I look at Jay on a microphone doing radio. It's just what he does. He doesn't have to be the radio guy. He's the radio guy. He's got to figure out how to be normal when he's not on the radio, yeah. right? Um, you know, and so I remember watching Jay and I remember thinking, damn, I don't know how to do that and I want to do that. You know what I'm saying? You know, I, I'm, I, I know how to work this microphone. I got to figure out how to make it translate. So, right. you know, there was... There was being enamored with radio and Lil Sean and Matt Locks, like I don't wanna I don't wanna take anything away from that crew of people. You know, I had somebody make a funny comment about how some of the recent cats that have landed on some radio stations in, in the last couple of years paved the way for colored people. <laughs> and they did say colored. Right. Um, <laughs> but for uh, for people of color in radio and I, I laugh, you know, when you got Super Snake and Matt Locks and you know, Jay and, you know, all these, all these brothers that came beforehand uh, that I feel like kind of get left out. You know what I'm saying? Lil Sean, Squeak Boogie, you know, who's not a brother, but he's my brother. You know what I mean? But, and so anyways, seeing all of these cats, I felt like, all right, I need to get it radio. So one day I got up and I went down to the radio station. This is like, you know, I'm in, I'm doing well at this time, right? Yeah. Um, label deal is going great, you know, or I'm sorry, label deal had gotten a little rocky, but I was touring we were looking for another label home, like, you know, this is like 94, or excuse me, 2004. Um, so I just woke up and decided I was gonna go fill out an application. So I went down to the station, and I'm sitting in the, in the lobby, and I'm filling out an application, and the morning show, the nuts of the morning come down. They're like, hey, you know, Boga Face, what's up, baby? Yeah. Mama, you know, like, hey, what are you doing? Right. <laughs> you know what I'm saying? I'm, like, I'm filling out an app, you know, and they're like, for what? <laughs> you know what I'm right. saying? I was like, I'm trying to be on the radio, man. What's up? You gonna let you put me on? You know, put me in, coach, right? Yeah. And, you know, and they laughed at first and like, you serious? Why you wanna do radio? You know, you got blah 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 going on. You know, I was like, hey, I've always wanted to try it, right? They like, can you do it? I was like, of course I can. Do you know the boards? Absolutely. No. No and no were the real answers to both questions, <laughs> yeah. right? Um, but you know, fake it till you make it. So they gave me a shot, man. The nuts in the morning gave me a shot. They told me to go have lunch with Bruce St. James, and if I could convince Bruce yeah. to give me a chance, then they would vouch, right? And so Bruce St. James gave me a chance, and they vouched. And I got in the radio. And it was surreal because I didn't know what I was doing, right? And Sugar Bear, uh, Jason Harris, he was out in Sacramento for a long time. Suge said, all right, come on, bro. P, let me show you, let me show you this and this. And DJ Nick Knack, I don't know where Nick Knack is now, oh, yeah. but Nick Knack was 18, he was brand new at the station, and he, I'm, I'm on Nick Knack, all right, hey, bro, come on, you gotta show me, you know, but Nick knew his shit, you know? And so they coached me through on the back end while I was watching Jay on the front end and bugging the shit out of Matt Locks and them, you know, for some, some, some side game, and, you know, the radio career just kind of built itself. Um, but to be quite honest, you know, I always looked at radio as a vehicle. Right. Early on, I probably didn't respect my position at power um, enough, not the way I should. You know, I was blessed to be on Friday Night Flavors. And at one point I was running Friday Night Flavors and, you know, working my shifts. And, and, and it really helped propel me in the later parts of my career and keep my name relevant in the city. You know, one thing I really take pride in is I've been relevant for about 26 years. Right in yeah. Arizona, you know, in one sh way, shape, or form, I can't think of a year where at some point I didn't matter, right? And at least I like to think so. Um, so I take a lot of pride in that longevity, right? And I had always thought about radio as a way to, to extend my longevity after, after music, um, but my heart wasn't really in it because, you know, I still didn't feel like radio was supporting the Arizona artists. And I remember being at Power and talking with Bruce St. James about playing my music and Bruce telling me, you know, basically, look, my afternoon guy does music. This was Jay, right, who was, I looked at it like my, my radio mentor. Uh, and if I'm gonna play anybody's music, I'll play Jay's because that's gonna help the station too. And I remember thinking, what the fuck are you talking about? I got a, I got a major recording contract, you know what I'm saying? I'm, I'm just, uh, you know, 
placed in the blaze battle and I'm, I'm doing this and I'm touring nationally and I've done writing and, and he pretty much just spit on me and you know at one point said hey look here's the truth man you know I'd love to play more hip-hop more black music you know more local music but there's just not enough y'all and if everybody listened at the same time it still isn't enough listenership to make me change what we're playing right and it hurt you know but it's real yeah. right unfortunately it's, it's the radio business right and I was resentful of Bruce for a long time because of that, before I really took a second to pause and understand radio and the radio business and the radio game and how it worked, right? Um, which is still some bullshit. There's a lot of smoke and mirrors, right? Oh, yeah. But, but um, there's a lot of beautiful things in radio too, right? And a lot comes out of it. And if you can play the game right, you can provide some opportunity. You know what I'm saying? And so that was my goal. I, um, I left Power late 2009. Um, took a hiatus, and then in 2011, I came on with 101.1 to beat. And they're more of a mom and pop station, locally, independently owned. They didn't have the big CRH broadcasting or Emmys or, you know, Clear Channel or CBS, you know, none of these big uh, radio behemoths behind them. Um, and there was a program director named Fred Rico there. He was out of Hawaii. He had come, and, you know, the beat was kind of like, eh, it was kind of a fledgling station, right? It had gained some traction, but it was a little more throwback, and a little more of my speed at the time, and I came in and I worked the first year, and I was so adamant and so annoying about putting the Arizona artists on the radio that it literally got to the point where in every staff meeting, they were like, and eh, poker face, what do you have to say? I'm like, you know what I have to say. We should be playing local records in regular rotation. I've heard records better than half of what we playing. How come we not supporting Arizona? Why are we, why are we not putting records on the radio? We should be playing this record, you know what I'm saying? And this is like, you know, this was all, all during my time at Power, but yeah. Power didn't care. And the whole first year at the beat, and finally, you know, I think Matt Locks might have helped me a little bit. He might have put a bug in Fred's ear. He'll never admit it. Um, but Fred was like, okay, Poker Face. Okay, what do you want to do? I was like, I want to show where I play local Arizona records. Nothing else, right? And he's like, can you do it? Is there even enough music? And I'm like, yeah, absolutely, sure. You know what I'm saying? Fuck yeah, I can. I don't know. You know what I'm saying? But again, you know, right. more often than not, the answer is yes, right? And I'll figure this shit out on the fly. So yeah. um, I told him I wanted, I wanted two hours. I, I told him I wanted four hours. He said, let's start with two. Um, so he gave me two hours. And in 2012, April 23rd, I want to say it was, we started a beat locker. Um, and the beat locker, came about because I had to sit and have a real honest conversation with myself about where I was in music, what I wanted, and what I wanted my legacy to be moving forward. Did I want to be known as, you know, a guy that, you know, just did some great rap records, you know what I'm saying? Or, or you know, how did I want to be thought of, right? Um, and so, you know, I decided that it was time for me to take the opportunities that I would normally provide for myself and, 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 and try to spread those around. Right. And so by creating a beat locker, the whole goal was to force the rest of the city's hand. Right. Cats would never believe it. But for me, the beat locker wasn't about me being big and famous. It wasn't about me getting any props. Um, none of that shit, because to be quite honest, it was a big inconvenience um, to do it. You know what I'm saying? The beat locker didn't pay me. They, the beat didn't pay me shit. You know what I'm saying? And I wasn't making any money off local hip hop. And I'm spending hours and hours and hours a week finding music and producing the show. And back then I had to produce it and bring it in. And so, you know, it was just a lot of extra time and work. But for me, it meant the world because I could give artists the opportunity that was so hard for me to get and that so many other people couldn't get. I mean, through years and years of doing hip hop in Arizona, man, nobody would give us radio play, right? right? And so I was super excited about it, you know? But I remember the city kind of being excited about it. But, you know, the first two years was like pulling teeth to get music out of people. Nobody really believed it. Yeah. Ah, the show won't last. Y'all, what time are they playing it, right? right? And so we had to work through all of that to even get cats to participate, you know? So that was a little bit disheartening. But once it caught on, man, it was dope, you know, because now we run in 30, 40 artists a week, you know, between features and mixes and you start to see the benefit, right? Because when we talk about forcing the city's hand, well, we didn't want to put local artists on shows because local artists don't have no value, but now we're playing local artists' music on the radio. <clears throat> right. 
and they're sewing it together with their streams and their online presence. And, you know, cats are getting looks and people are updating their, their stage productions because they know that more opportunities are coming. So you start to see more local artists on more local, on more hip hop shows. And, you know, a lot of these punk ass promoters do the pay to play thing, which it is what it is. But either way, right, the opportunities were coming, even if they were backhanded opportunities. And so we started to see more of that. We started to see more venues allowing local shows and allowing artists to come in and bring their music in. Um, you know, now we're starting to see more local music being played in the clubs. We have the club DJs on board, you know what I'm saying? Um, then spinning local music here help artists get on in other markets. So you start to hear about artists getting airplay and they're using, you know, what the, the few spins they're getting here that are tracking the media base, right? They're using that to be able to get another market. So we started to really force hands, you know what I'm saying? And it felt good. And we started to see the opportunities happen. And then, you know, the biggest compliment ever was when Power put together a show called Ground Zero, you know, which was essentially put in the market to offset what the beat locker was doing, right? Yeah. Which is perfect. That's what I wanted. You know what I'm saying? I, holy shit. Is the, other, is the other station playing local music now too? Mission accomplished. You know what I'm saying? A lot of people were like, yo, they trying to blah, blah, blah. You know, and I'm like, yeah, yeah, yeah. That's fucking great. I love Mad Rich. You know what I'm saying? Let, let Rich do his thing. You know what I'm saying? Yeah. This is the idea. It's not... Us being the only game in town is not the idea. It's how many more games can we open up, right? How many more opportunities? So it was really dope, you know what I'm saying? Because, you know, at that point, you know, even though they were the competition, you know, it was, um, it was just good to see everybody embrace it. It was good to hear Sincerely Collins in rotation on power, you know what right. I'm saying? As somebody who's been in the scene forever, you know, those moments, those milestones mean everything to us. You know what I'm saying? And I know, you know, some of the cat, you know, you, you listen to Jealousy and you hear, you hear motherfuckers talk and, and do all the, all, the, all the envious shit. And I just think to myself, man, how could you feel that way? Him getting on means now there's a path to you getting on, stupid. Right. So all you got to do is be on top of your shit. He just, he just cleared, cleared the sidewalk, right? You know, some of us laid the sidewalk. He just swept it off and, and, and reminded niggas there's a sidewalk again, right? And so, you know, Futuristic getting on and, and Mickey Zobel had a record spinning and like all these, di these different cats. And so, you know, it's, radio has really been one of my crowning achievements, but not because of what I've done in radio, but because of what radio has become since I've been in it, right? And, and the opportunities now available to so many other artists, man, that we literally had to crawl and fight and beg and borrow and, you know what I'm saying, uh, give hand jobs for. I mean, not literally, but I mean, damn near, right, right to get right. on the fucking air, right? So, right. you know, when I think about radio, that's what I think about, you know, and, and it is fun. For me, it's fun. I, you know, I'm, a, I'm an old rapper uh, now that, that can, can, can talk and say whatever the fuck I want on the radio, you know what I'm saying? It's great. You know, and I still watch niggas, so don't get it twisted when I say I'm an old rapper. <laughs> um, now, nah, but but you know it's it's um it's just it's it's beautiful to see you know what I'm saying and and for me you know it 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 makes my time on this ball of dirt a little bit more meaningful you know knowing that you know I've a, I've been able to inspire people um, to help bring some people along and then to elevate some people you know kind of all in the same strange career right it's still far from over so. You know, who knows where it'll go, but it's come full circle. So we just brought the Beat Locker. You know, for those that don't know, the Beat Locker is the first ever uh, FM radio show dedicated solely to Arizona hip hop and urban music, right? Solely, right? We don't play nothing but. And, you know, to my knowledge, when we started, we were one of the only shows in the country um, that was specifically dedicated to a region's local music on an FM radio station, right? Um, and it's just, yeah, I mean, it's, it's, uh, it's just great, man. It feels good. You know what I'm saying? And uh, we're now in our ninth year, or just wrapped our ninth year, going into our tenth. Uh, and uh, the tenth year will be on Power 98.3. It's, it's amazing how things come full circle. Uh, but we just had a DJ John Blaze, who's another just, you know, champion for the scene. Uh, Mr. Lovely, who's all about the community, and of course my, my ace, DJ Marvel. So, uh, man, excited. Excited about the future and, um, you know, next stop syndication. All right, we're going to bring the whole Southwest up. So, that's the goal. So how does it feel, how does it feel to be loved, right? Um, I mean, amazing, right? I mean, honestly, 
It's always weird talking about myself. You know, for as arrogant as I'm sure I come off, I don't really like to talk about myself a lot. Um, you know, it's, it's dope. You really, you do, this, you do this to be loved. You know, anybody tells you different, they're lying. You know, of course you want the money, but to get the money, you gotta be loved. You know what I mean? Um, you know, for me, it's always, it's always humbling to think about how many people I've come across, um, how many people have told me, right, that they've either been inspired by something I've done or said, or, or you know, how many people that I, I've touched and, and I know that, you know, I made a deliberate action to help them. Um, and then how many people have helped me, you know, to be quite honest, um, you know, when I think about how loved I may be, I think about all the, all the people that have helped me along the way, you know, to be standing here right now with somebody being interested in what I have to say and what I've done, um, it's just remarkable, man. I'm just a dude from Louisville, Kentucky that somehow ended up in, in Phoenix at 10 years old and been here ever since, right? So, um, you know, it's dope, but it, it, it's just a reminder, you know, without, without Tyree Michael Carter and DJ Daryl D and Fade and Miko Wadey and, you know, Lil Sean and, and my whole associates crew and my whole league, you know, uh, M.E., my experience and Floss Genius and uh, life, you know what I'm saying? Jay Lilly, my, my, my man, Hannibal Leck, like these are all people that have come in and out of my life and that have made it possible for me to be standing here, man. You know, proof, um, you know, on, and on, on up to every exec I've ever worked with and, you know, shit, all you haters, I mean, to be honest, it, it, it takes a village, right? Um, so, you know, even with the hate, you know, I know that's just misguided love. That's all. You're just trying to figure it out. Yeah. You know what I'm saying? So, I don't know, man. It's, it's the best thing ever. Um, it makes you feel like what you've done is worthwhile. And again, you know, when I, when I leave here now, I, I have a daughter that I'm leaving, which is, which is amazing by itself. It's the best thing I've ever done, right? Everything I've talked about up till now means shit compared to having my daughter. Um, but... You know, it's good to know that uh, when people speak of me, when I'm not around, hopefully they'll be speaking beautifully, right? Um, but yeah, man, you know, that's five. I, I know I didn't gave y'all a little bit more than five, uh, but I appreciate it. I appreciate Mr. Miranda here uh, for doing this. This is amazing, right? Um, just bringing something to you that you may not have known, may not have heard. I don't know, you might have looked at me different before this. You might look at me a little bit different afterwards. Or you might be like, he's the same old arrogant motherfucker. He just, <laughs> he just speaks well. You know what I'm saying? Who knows? But um, it's dope. Man. You know what I'm saying? It's dope. I uh, definitely feel the love right here. We just give me five, and um, of course it'll be reciprocated. You know what I'm saying? Um, and I love Phoenix. I mean, where would I be without Phoenix, Arizona? You know, um, it's, it's a reciprocal thing, and, and uh, I'm gonna keep loving y'all. Y'all keep loving me, and, and we gonna keep. Keep moving forward, man. It's your boy Poker Face. <laughs> I almost said the wrong station. Power 98.3 represent. Beat Locker represent. You know what I'm saying? Uh, 20 something years and counting and no sign of slowing down. Appreciate it. Sooner or later, I'll come back and get five more from you. Peace. All right, wait. Time out. Before I go anywhere, I forgot to shout out the most important person. Mrs. Poker Face. Cat, none of this is possible without you. She held me down for 26 and counting, and uh, we still got plenty more. So if I got to shout anybody out, it's Cat, Mrs. Poker Face, Natasha Conway Long, whatever it is you want to call her. Um, that's my rock. All right, I'm done with my fire. And there you have it. Nothing but love and respect for my man Poker Face. You know, you, sir, are a true gem to the culture, to the scene. And I would like to personally thank you for always supporting me throughout my musical journey. You know, that's something that I'll never forget. I will always be grateful for. And, uh, you know, I just wish you nothing but success. You know, make sure you guys are following him on social media. Shout out to my brother Jimmy Nelson on that camera. Make sure you guys subscribe to the YouTube channel. 
And man, I hope you guys enjoyed this episode because this was truly, truly awesome. And uh, just continue being great, continue holding your head high and keeping that faith. And until next time, stay tuned, stay blessed, stay healthy, and just give me five, y'all. Yeah.